If life to be solved, why do people keep seeking solutions in all the wrong places? Haven't you heard? The answers lie within. Master alchemist Debbie Unterman believes she has the key. After four decades of delving into people's minds, she's here to help you discover the secret. The journey begins by learning to love the voices you hear in your head. What are we waiting for? Let's begin. Here's Debbie. Hello, this is Debbie Unterman with Love the Voices on Bold Brave TV. I will be having a guest again, the same guest as last week, Stephen G. Taibbi. And I'm very excited. He gave me a little scare. I could call it a little mini heart attack, but that's who he is. Uh, just kind of uh, waited till the last minute to make sure that I knew that he knew that we were on today. So anyway, that took me a little bit from finishing his book. I'm about that close, just a few pages to go, but it is really amazing. I'm going to highly recommend it to everybody because Steve has had an experience. You know, sometimes you can say, um, like this is a question I wanted to ask, who would you go to as a relationship expert for longevity in a marriage. I like to go to centenarians and people who have been together for like 75 years because they have experienced what it means to stay in a relationship for that long. So we could say that Steve has had experiences that no one can deny because we haven't been there yet. And what am I talking about? Well, one of the things that has happened to him is he has died a couple of times. He's had some of those near death experiences, NDEs that we talk about. And I think there is an interest in life after death right now, just by going from the, uh, the network TV shows, right? We have ghosts, and we have not dead yet. And that's my favorite, actually. That's where someone is doing obituaries for the newspaper. And every time they give her someone new, the ghost of the person who just died pops up and she is speaking to them. I like that one better than the show called Ghosts. Um, but you know, they're going to give you different experiences of what it's like. And it's just the writer's idea. Like, that's one reason I really don't like ghosts, even though it's a huge hit on CBS, because they show you people who have died and now they look exactly like they did the second they died. The guy with no pants on because he didn't have pants on when he died. It's like that's some Hollywood idea about life after death. So we talked about, and I read at the beginning of the last show a week ago, what happened during one of his times out of his body when he was just a, a little boy. There was another time that he had that maybe he will tell you about, but I wanna read an excerpt for a third event he had that he does not call an NDE because he wasn't dead. Um, I don't think that they pronounced him dead like they did other times, but he was definitely out of his body. He was out of his body. He was having an experience. And that's what I'm talking about. You can't deny someone's experience. It may not conform to your beliefs, to your religious beliefs, to what you've been taught, but you can't say that they did not experience that. So I wanna read a part of his book. If anyone is reading along, they can turn to me. <laughs> this is like a hymnal <laughs> to page 246. 
uh, the first full paragraph down. And this was when he was actually having a pacemaker put in. And I love the way he decided to get one because he was told beforehand that he needed a pacemaker, but he would not do it. And I'm looking for the exact word that his doctor uh, told him. Something about like, your heart is not compatible with life. And he finally got, okay, I guess I need one. And he was, you know, when you're going for something for the first time, like let's say uh, a colonoscopy, which I have not had, you don't know what it's gonna be like. But once you've already had one, and then you go back for one, you can almost be nervous about it because you know what you might be experiencing. So he was getting a little nervous about this. Um, and I hope that I am doing the, the right story that I have. Uh, <laughs> yep, I think this is it. Um, okay that i had planned to do because he threw me today my scary me and i wasn't as prepared as i wanted to be but this is a good this is a good uh, couple of pages i want to read here they had given me a mild sedative and the placement of the pacemaker was going to be done using local anest anesthetics they were going to make a pocket out of the muscle of my upper chest wall to give the pacemaker a place to reside. They were also going to add a support section to the artery and then thread two thin cables through that support and artery into my heart. The cables would then be located permanently in my heart using the self-taping screws at the end of each cable that would screw into the heart muscle itself. The sedative did nothing for the tremendous anxiety I was experiencing. I can't remember a single time in my life when I was so anxious, well, damned scared, I was stiff as a board with fright. I was so stiff. You could have used my body as a bridge between two points. When I realized just how rigid I was, a tiny part of my rationality appeared. Okay, I said to myself, you're stiff as a board. All of your muscles are tremendously tensed and that can't be good for the surgery. It can only hurt you. Okay, okay, I have to relax, but how? Then I said to myself, why not start by saying the Lord's Prayer? So I did, silently to myself, but I don't think I ever said it with as much emotion and conviction as I did then. That seemed to help, now what? I know a lot of people would at that point have asked for something, please make the operation go well, please don't let it hurt, and so on. But I couldn't do that. I've always had this feeling and I know a lot of people don't share this sentiment and that's fine, but I just don't believe I can ask God for things. He's not my butler. It's quite the other way around. I think, I think we're supposed to be the instrument of his will. What business do I have asking him for something? Well, that's what I believe anyway. We're all unique. And this is just the way I deal with God. You believe what you believe. You'll get no argument from me, right? That's what I'm saying is we all have our own beliefs, but now we're gonna talk about an experience. So I started thinking I was supposed to be dead when I was five, then again at six. I wasn't supposed to make it past 10, but I did. Then I almost died on my 17th birthday and the next few days after, but divine intervention had taken me I can, had taken care of me instead. Then I wasn't supposed to get out of my 20s. And yet at age 33, I was told I'd beaten the whole thing. I'm a pilot. I owned my own television production company and a marketing business. I had a beautiful home complete with a beautiful wife and a pug that peed all over. And that's his sense of humor. And there I was after all of that at age 46, an age no gambler would have ever bet that I'd attain. Best of all, I'd lived through more in my 46 years than most who live into their 80s did. In all the ways that truly counted, I was a wealthy man. And so I started to get grateful. Remember the name of his book is, 
grateful guilt, right? Gratitude is a big part of Steve's journey. So let's see where I was. Down to the bottom of my soul, grateful. As I recounted all that I just stated and gave my deepest thanks for each and every one of them, something wondrous happened. I suddenly felt a presence, not of one individual, but of many. Then I heard it. A chorus of voices sang, ah, that's my attempt to replicate what he was hearing. It was unbelievably beautiful. I knew instantly what it was that I had just heard. It was the chorale, C-H-O-R-A-L-E, the chorus of angels. And then I became filled with a warmth, which is as close as I'll ever get to describing it. This warmth not only filled me, but surrounded me, held me, assured me. Next thing I knew, I was being flooded, downright flooded with the purest love I had ever known. It was miraculous in the most literal sense of the word, and all my fears completely vanished. My stark sense of the word and all my fears completely vanished. Okay, I missed a line. My stark terror had been replaced with joy and bliss and this incredible, all-consuming feeling of love. I was loved and I wasn't alone. And I was being told in no uncertain terms. Tears of joy were streaming down my face. It was incredibly beautiful. I'd go through everything I'd ever been through before, all the pain, the suffering, the fear all over again, just to relive that moment. It was one of the most powerful experiences I ever had in my entire life, second only to my NDE. I'd been given another gift. I was overflowing with gratitude, gratitude for every single thing that had ever happened to me in my life, good or bad. It was an epiphany and it changed my life especially how I would handle the weight for an organ and the transplant itself. From that moment on, all the way through to the end of transplant, I had no fears of anything. I was in a place of peace and serenity. I cherished my latest gift and lived in the attitude of gratitude that had been infused into me by the members of that chorale. And who knows, maybe The Voice, capital T, capital V, had something or everything to do with this as well. So I would like to now present Steve. So can we get him on camera? All right, Hello. how was my reading? It was very good, actually. Thank you. Uh, what would I you thought like you did a nice job. in person? Huh? I didn't hear you. I'm what sorry. Would you like to, what would you like to add personally, not from the book, but you now we get to hear you yourself talk about that experience and the attitude of gratitude and the voice. You talk about those a lot in your book. Well, you, you know what the voice is, um, is uh, referring to, right? The voice is the voice that told me to go back when I had my NDE. That's what I mean by the right. voice. <clears throat> but um, that that uh, that experience with with the corral and um, it set me up for a belief system that I have uh, that has stayed with me ever since, and that I believe in deeply. And that that belief system is that. Um, well, the first thing that the corral set me up for was from that moment on until a member of my family ruined it, um, I was living perfectly 50-50. Uh, and that's something that I wish I could- I know what you mean by 50-50. I was about to explain that. know what you mean. Yeah, 50-50 okay. means from that moment on, I was 
50% ready to die and 50% ready to live. And either one of them would have been okay. And living in 50-50 is like the most Zen place you could ever be. You have no fear, nothing concerns you because either way is okay. And if you're gonna try to do 50-50, you cannot do it 49-51, you cannot do it 45-55, it has to be exactly 50-50, you're walking a tightrope. But it's not like walking a tightrope, it's not like, you know, oh my God, I'm gonna fall. It's, it's, uh, it's just that you have to walk this line exactly in half, ready to die, ready to live satisfied and 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 uh and ready for whichever one happens and that takes a that takes not only gratitude it takes faith uh, which i also believe in uh, and i'm not talking about mm -hmm. necessarily from a religion so uh you know your own faith in things and you know and that takes us back to part of the gratitude thing gratitude is really misunderstood by a lot of people um, not that I'm a Bible thumper because I'm not, but the Bible does say that you have to be grateful in all things. And that was the secret to that. I was grateful that I was in that machine getting that surgery. I've been grateful for every bad thing that's happened to me. I've been grateful for every good thing that's happened to me. But that's the thing about gratitude is you know, how many times, Debbie, have you had something happen to you and at the moment you couldn't stand it, but it turned out to be really good for you later on, right? Every one of us has had that, right? I know. And that's, that, right. And that's, that's just one of the reasons. Someone bigger than us, you know, saying, right. yeah, 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 you think it's not so good, but just wait, you know. And we that's why you have to be do. grateful of everything. So, when I was laying in agony after my second operation and my the, the story after my second heart transplant was horrific. I mean, really, I had two different doctors tell me that I had the kind of pain that prisoners of war had. That's how bad it was. And they said it only had happened one other time in the history of the hospital, what happened to me. So it was brutal. I mean, it was genuinely brutal. And it's kind of the kind of thing where when people go, oh, I was in agony because they bumped their toe, you know. I want to go, oh, yeah, you want to know what agony is? <laughs> you know, but it's really, and actually, I don't want them to know what agony is. Nobody nobody should have to know what agony is, but I do. And uh, uh, But even during that time, the way I got through the agony was by being grateful for it. Because I realized that there's a reason why I'm in this agony. And it's not up to me to figure it out. It's that this is a lesson, a part of the journey of why I'm here that agony is part of it. So I have to be grateful for it. And when you do that, when you can master gratitude for all the things that are bad, as well as all the things, I mean, it's really easy to say, oh, look, I won a million dollars. I'm grateful. Well, yeah, that's pretty darn easy to be grateful for. But when you can say you're grateful because your mother just died in your arms, which happened to me, uh, now you've reached a whole new level. And once you do that, your whole life will be different. It's kind of like the prayers that you were also talking about right there in that little excerpt that I read that most people will pray and ask for right. something. But that's not how you pray either. No, because I, I don't think I can, because God's not my butler. I always say that. God is not my butler. <laughs> I love that. If, if, anybody's my, if, if anybody is a servant in that relationship, it's me. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not my place to put God in the, in the position of being my servant. That's how I feel. Now, I know there are a lot of people, a lot of Catholics, a lot of, actually, every religion has told me I'm wrong about that, that you're supposed to ask. They all tell me that. But I've never, I've okay, never but really believed religion. that. Okay, but they're religion. You're talking about, yeah, people who are going by the book, right? Right, right. And that's where I'm saying that people with experiences are a different caliber than people who have read a book and interpret yeah. a book. And that's what we have you on for because nobody's had the experience. In fact, I just got through reading about your first transplant. I don't think your second one is in the book. Is that true? No, it's I not. Have a few pages to go. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's, they it's, it's, it's to, mentioned. 
It's mentioned at the end, but it's a, it's okay. not, got, you know, you don't go through it. Okay. Yeah. But what they had to do, which no one else is going to have this experience, even with a transplant, is they had to go through scar tissue from your first two open heart surgeries Three. as a kid. Oh, Three. Yeah, you mean, oh, you mean for the fir for this first the, transplant? Yes, yes. The fir the, yeah, they had to go yeah. through the scar tissue. So the pain, you say that transplant, you, you call them transplants, right? You, you call people transplants. Is that what the way that you're putting it? I'm a transplant? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could say I'm a transplant, right? and and if I'm in a room full of people who are transplants, then it's, then it's an S. Yeah, you know, okay. that's what we call ourselves. We're transplants. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So transplants are all going to have a similar experience, but even that experience is going to be different from yours because of your first two open heart surgeries as a little boy, and then the fact that you've had two heart transplants two new hearts so i mean we have there's so many little things that we could talk about uh well, are if you, you just the think only of, one that both what? of those things the the first well, the, the fact you had the the first two open heart surgeries that's you're the you're the first forever on that right right that those those first. surgeries i was the first one to live through too yes but okay but uh and then if you, so you think about how much scar tissue i had when i went for my third transplant Think about oh, how much boy. scar tissue I had after my. That's why my heart, my fourth, my fourth open heart for my second transplant was such a, such a. a it was horrible. It was really horrible. It almost, it almost killed me, you know. But uh, and and uh, it, it, I was open for I was open for uh for three days. They put me they put me the heart in on the Whoa. ninth and they closed me on the eleventh. Literally, it was very brutal. different. Was... And this one, this one, <laughs> yeah. you went in on March, March 27th, which is the day my mother died. Now it was three right. in the morning. So it was probably the 28th by the time you had it. But I feel like my mom and you crossed somewhere like you were both in that other plane. I mean, I can't believe of all the days my mother might have died at 72, that it was that day of your first transplant. And um, you were home at your mother's birthday party, right? Uh, a few days later, uh, uh, 10 days, uh, 14, 14 days later. Yeah. 14. Yeah. I almost so made it. I, I would have got, I would have gotten out in 10 days if, but they couldn't get a drug level up high enough. So I, I, I was, I, I did really well on my first heart transplant. It was amazing. Uh, even though they had to hack and saw their way, as the doctor said it, uh, through yeah. the scar yeah. tissue, but, um, I did really well. The other, the other now, you got to remember, most people get a heart transplant. This is their first surgery. So compared to any of my my transplants, either mine, they were pieces of cake relatively, unless they were so sick or they had some other kind of thing. But if they were healthy enough, their transplants usually go very easily compared to what I went through. You know, open heart surgery is, according to every surgeon I've ever talked to, the most the most painful of all the surgeries is open heart surgery so, uh, because they have to spread your ribs apart. You know, they have to use a uh, rib spreader. Talk you know, about they, that. Talk about that. Because I don't think people get it that they have to, what, break your ribs or how do they stretch them? They, to... You basically do a, a, a an imitation of a lobster, you know. So uh, that they do is they, 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 they take starting. a scalp, they take a scalpel, they cut through all the muscle and skin, right? And all the muscles that go across your chest are, are cut in half. And then they take a skill saw you know, like they would for woodworking, except it's all stainless steel. And they use a skill saw on you. They just and cut you in half, right? And then they put this thing in cold, <laughs> they put this thing in cold, a rib spreader, and it goes like this, right? And they, and they crank it open. You know, they literally, they crank it. They crank it and it cranks open so that they can spread everything apart. And then you have ribs at the top that have to be folded back. And that causes a great deal of pain when they're folded back for three days. You know, oh, so. boy. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, and, and, you know, humor, humor is your friend. That's, that's mm -hmm. how you deal with it, right? Um, if there's something I like to get across to everybody, it's that you got to remember, if you have to go to the hospital, if you have to go to the hospital, if you're sick, whatever, whatever, right? 
It's not the doctor who heals you. It's you who heals you. You have to always be aware that the doctor may give you life-saving surgery. The doctor may give you drugs, but the decision to heal is yours. So it's all about patient responsibility. So, you know, you have to, you have to keep your mind in a place where you can actively heal. So if you're going to actively heal, humor is one of those ways that keep your, keep you up. If you start being depressed, you're not going to heal. So, you know, how many, I mean, how many times have, have you heard this about somebody who died because, uh, you know, the doctor said, well, he just wasn't fighting or she just wasn't fighting. Or you hear, we didn't think that they'd make it, but boy, were they a fighter. It's, that's the difference. So it's up to each patient to make up their mind if they're going to be the one who does the healing or not. You cannot leave it to your doctor. The doctor does not heal you. You heal you. And that's a very important like point for people. It's, it's a big distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I remember saying to you something about your nurses and I was saying that they're the real healers. And you said to me, you corrected me, this was off camera and you said, no, the patient is the real healer. Yes, but the, the, the nurses, nurses may be great. Advocates. Oh, oh, my nurse, you can't get along without the nurses. I mean, it's yeah. look, it, this is a very, very good distinction to understand. OK, the doctor and the nurses and the drugs and the operations they promote healing you do the healing so they set the table for you to heal then it's up to you to do the healing and that's what you have to realize so you know right. if you go to the doctor you say doctor can you heal me and the doctor says yes you're both wrong the doctor can heal you and you can't give up your healing to the doctor if you want to survive then you have to understand what your part in the survival is so oh, when we come back, let's see if you can tell us some of the stories of how you bullied your heart and an exercise you did with your foot. I think it's very interesting. Uh, so we got to go away for a couple of minutes and we will be back to hear some more amazing stories from Stephen Taibbi. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hello, this is Debbie Unterman. You're back with me on Love the Voices on Bold Brave TV and also with my friend Steve Taibbi, who has a book about uh, going through a lot of stuff with his heart called Grateful Guilt Living in the Shadow of My Heart. 
and we're talking about some of the ways that he stayed alive. I mean, I mean talk about, we're, we're going to talk about how you, what you called bullied your heart. But I also want to talk about the bullies. So we're, we're switching a little bit here because I want to go back. I don't want to miss out talking about children sometimes being really cruel and the things that you went through and yet kids picked on you and talk about bullies. You found a way to finally stop the bullying too. So let's talk about bullies and bullying your heart and uh, go ahead and whichever you want to talk about first. Well, I don't want to spend too much time about bullies, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, there's one fact about a bully, and it's always true. All bullies are cowards. They're absolute snivering cowards underneath. Uh, it took me a long time to figure that out, uh, but they always have a pack. They're never by themselves. They they always have these little sycophants who follow them around, and and they prove their worth to their to their sycophants by bullying somebody much smaller and weaker than they are. Uh, and finally, one day I'd had enough of it. And I just in blind rage attacked my bully who was much bigger than I was. And I beat the snot out of him. And that, you know, and then I did it for a few other days after that, just because I could, after I realized, hey, I could do this. And I, I beat this guy up three or four times, just because I was getting back at him for every other bully that had done anything to him, to me. And, uh, I wasn't satisfied. And this was at a camp until I heard a counselor call me a bully. And then finally (laughs) that made me feel great, (laughs) you know, but I had bullied, I had bullied the bully, but I, I, I mean, I gotta tell you, uh, I, I, I beat the crap out of this guy several times. Uh, and he was probably at least a head taller than I was at least he was older. He was bigger. And he was picking on me and he's, you know, beating me up every day. And then one day I decided I was going to beat him up every day. And I did. Uh, And then one other time when I got into the eighth grade, one of the football players, I was the new kid in the school. One of the football players decided that he was going to attack me. We were waiting to get into the cafeteria and they, we had to wait in this big hallway in, uh, in front of the cafeteria until they opened the doors. And he decided to attack me. He started shoving me. And um, and each time he shoved me, it was like with that attitude. So what are you going to do about it? This guy was massively larger than I was. And um, so I decided the heck with this. I wasn't going to because I think this is my first day in the school. I was not going to be bullied again. So I just put my head down and rammed him into a wall with everything I had. His head hit the back of the cinder block wall. And I and as I had him against the wall, I took my knee and I hit him where guys don't like to get hit with everything I had in my, with my knee. And when he bent down, I double fisted my, my, uh, I made a double fist, you know, like this. And I came up from underneath and caught him in the chin. I could hear his teeth clack shut when I did that. And he almost, he just slid along the wall and he was, he, I almost knocked him out. So, the whole school saw that happen because he wanted the whole school to see me get bullied. But instead, the whole school saw me beat up a football player. And I was half his size, literally half his size. So I never got bullied again after that. And I think after that, I had some kind of something in me that other people saw that I never had before. But, you know, once I beat up a guy twice my size, you know, everybody left me alone. So that's how I handled bullies. I hate to say that you have to do that, but uh, sometimes you do, I think, because some people it just- seems uh, well, to always be the way that that is yeah. what you have to do to get them to stop. You know, and I'm just, I'm just thinking about all of the stories in your book and all the different camps. And it seems that every year it was a new camp. You were always the new kid and so many different schools, you're the new kid. Uh, except there was that heart camp mm-hmm. and there was a bully there, but that was a different ending to yeah. that. He, the heart he died. Camp. Yeah. He I mean, I, I, I mean, every year I'd go to this camp. I only went to this camp by uh, three years. I think I don't remember now, but uh, you'd go in my first year. He was like the darling of the camp and he was really picking on me and he made my life miserable there. 
And then the next year I went and, uh, and every year that you went to this camp, you were asking about people and they would say, well, they're not alive anymore. And cause we were all heart children. And, uh, he was one of them who didn't survive. Something happened to him with his heart and he died. And, uh, so that ended that bullying thing, but it was not because I did anything, you know? Right. Um, but yeah. But it changed your experience at camp. And there were, there were things that you did to get away. There were trees that you climbed. There was that experience of going underneath Northern Boulevard that I'm, yeah. I'm trying to picture that you were skinny. Yeah. And I know you were skinny because I know you. I was skinny too. Um, and you went into a pipe or something and went underneath Northern Boulevard and would listen to the cars above you. I, I'm trying to kind of picture that one. It's a tough one to picture, but you had no, I'd go in there. I would go in there to take naps. I would uh, you know, crawl into this <laughs> uh, drainage pipe that went uh, from what, my property to the other side of Northern Boulevard. And, and, I, and I couldn't hear the cars because of all the cement, but I knew that they were above me. And it was something thrilling to me about that I was lying underneath passing cars. So, you know, and then I also thought, well, what if I died in here? Nobody would ever find me, you know, but that, know. yeah, that, yeah, but that, I, I used know. to really, I, I used to go in there just to, uh, just to take a nap or just to relax and be in a place where I knew I was completely by myself, you know, to have some but, peace. And that was from your own, your own family, right? That was at, at home. From everything, from everything, yeah. not just my family, from yeah. everything that was going on in my life. It was a place where I could get away. Just like climbing the tree was on my property. That was, um, I could just get away. Nobody knew I was there, you know, and uh, I could just be at peace. That's what uh, flying sailplanes, you know, gliders did for me too. I would have a real tough week, week working in television production and I'd get in my glider and I'd just, you know, everything, nothing mattered except that I was flying. I had no worries, no matter what happened in television, no matter what happened in my personal life. You know, when you're several thousand feet in the air in, in an engineless airplane, all you, all you do is fly the plane and just relax and look at how beautiful everything is, you know, and have the sensation of flying. And that was my big escape for a long time was flying, which I told you, I, you know, partially was because of the seagull I used to escape on was mm -hmm. why I became a pilot. But yeah. But so I, I love how you were able to kind of trick the doctors and the whole medical industry about that you were not allowed to be a pilot. And then you find out in New Jersey from this guy that you could get a glider's license. Yes, if you had a, if you had a, life. if you had a driver's license, you could be a glider <laughs> driver's pilot. Driver's license. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you you didn't bother telling the doctors, right? You just made it your little secret. <laughs> I made it my secret until the point that I had my license, which was two years from the time I started, you know, and um, I had always asked him for if I could get a note to be a pilot. He wouldn't give it to me. And if he wouldn't give it to me, I would never become a pilot because if the FAA sees that you have a problem, they go to your doctor. You can't just go to any other doctor. They go to your doctor. So... At least they did then. So if uh, so, he was never going to allow me to be a pilot. So I just when I found out that all I needed was a driver's license, I became a pilot. <laughs> you know, he got <laughs> really great. he got really he got really mad at me. <laughs> he really did. <laughs> and then he and he goes to be like this, wagging his finger in my face, going, "Whatever you yeah. do, no acrobatics." And so I have six hours oh, of yeah, acrobatics so in my it. book. <laughs> yeah. He must have known you better than that. They didn't get the reverse psychology. It was the best no, way. He didn't. It you was know, the best way to do. Do some acrobatics, and then you wouldn't, right? Right, right. <laughs> and I got to tell you something. Uh, doing acrobatics. I mean, it's one thing. There at the time that I was a pilot, uh, an active pilot. There were maybe twelve to nineteen thousand active glider pilots in the entire nation, and that's a pretty small group. And uh, and acrobatic pilots is an even smaller group. And there is just something about the fact that you know how to make an airplane flip around in the sky, that you're one of very few people who can do that. And it just does something for you. It makes you feel good. And plus which flipping an airplane around the sky is a lot of fun, you know? So I, I always enjoyed it. Yeah. And, and feeling good about yourself, your feats, you know, 
would have to be really important to you because the subject, I mean, you call your book Grateful Guilt, not Grateful Shame, but the subject of shame continues to come up over and over again. In fact, I had to peek at like the last page and it seemed like it never went away that this feeling of not being good. And I, you know, as a therapist, I work with that, that idea of shame and it's a tough one. It is really tough for therapists and to heal people of shame. Um, do you think that your humor is one of your ways of combating that? Well, my feet, my humor uh, has been for several things. I mean, it's because I have to make light of certain situations, otherwise I wouldn't get through them. It's because I could hide behind it. A lot of it was hiding, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I found that if I could make a room laugh, then they weren't going to be beating me up. Uh, mm. So there were a lot of there were a lot of reasons, and and laughter is the best medicine. There's no doubt about it. Uh, if you're in a hospital, make sure you laugh as much as you can. Uh, make sure you make your doctors laugh and your nurses laugh. I mean, I, you know, every every uh, every uh, doctor or nurse in my hospital couldn't wait to get into my room. And there are other rooms that they dreaded, but my room they liked to go into, and we always had a good time. And you know, uh, the, those are things you need to do when you're in the hospital. I mean. Yeah, you know, what kills me the most is when somebody starts yelling at a doctor. To me, that's like yelling at a cop. Uh, I had a friend who was a cop, and I told him he was telling me about a guy he pulled over for speeding. He just wanted to check out his car. He wasn't going to give him a ticket. And the guy said, "What the f do you want?" And I said to him, "I would never say that to a guy who carries a gun." And he goes, "A gun?" Mm. He goes, the heck? "He goes the heck with my gun. I have a pen." He, he goes. Uh, he goes. I wrote. Yeah. The, he goes. I, I wrote the guy like thirty different tickets, and he got him for oh, no. every tiny little thing that he could get him for. Now, when you go to court with a bunch of tickets, you, the the cop is telling the judge this guy was a real jerk. Nail him. That's what the cop is telling you. So if you get a a big handful of tickets, you're not getting off because the the okay. judge knows that you deserve it. So in the same it's sense. A clue. Yeah, if you're if you're yelling and screaming at your at your nurses or your doctors and the hospital staff, what kind of an idiot are you? I mean, they're the ones with the needles, they're the ones with the scalpels, and you're yelling at them, you know. But now, but you did not have a hurt real you. way. You what? you I mean, you had enough experience, but you had a way of being um, an advocate for yourself. Yeah. where you made the doctors and nurses and orderlies and everyone who came into your room know the respect that you yes. needed, craved, deserved, and would not tolerate anything less. And there was one that you had to fire because yeah. he walked into your bathroom without permission, mm -hmm. and that was it. And you know that they work for you and not the opposite. So I want you to talk about that, but I also want you to talk about, or I, I want to ask you, do you know about Bernie Siegel and the way he talks about humor, Dr. Bernie Siegel? Because he, he came out in the late 80s yeah. with the idea yeah. of exceptional patients. And he called exceptional patients the ones that would advocate for themselves and even complain. And you made demands. It wasn't really complain as much like terms of endearment um, as it was just being very clear, being very kind, being very polite, uh, yes. using humor. That's the, most, and, that's the most important part. And advocating for yourself. So, you know, I, I want you to just tell people because you've been in hospitals more than a lot of people. Just well, I've only, I've only fired, I've only fired one doctor. And uh, he had, and he made me really angry, and he showed me huge disrespect. So I fired his butt right then and there. Uh, but uh, actually, I was so angry, I didn't even fire him. Then he left the room, and my doctor shut, and my doctor came in, and I was still fuming. And I and I, I told him what had just happened, and I said, um, I said, you tell him he's fired. He better not charge me for today. I won't pay it. It won't. I'll tell my insurance company not to pay it. I said I don't ever want to see his face again. And uh, my doctor was like, okay. Now, 
you have to have a certain currency to get away with something like that. And that currency I had was I was polite to everybody. I was nice to everybody. I was thankful to everybody. Everybody knew who I was. And for me to be that angry, everybody said, wow, he must have really crossed the line. So they were automatically on my side. And and that's, you know, all part of being an advocate for yourself is you have to be the nicest patient in the hospital because you want them to want to be in your room. That's the whole trick. You want them to want to you, be with you. Yeah. But, you also really stood up for yourself like the the one uh I think it was I think it was a doctor, a woman doctor who was going to look at your groin and she just yeah. came in saying, um, uh, you know, can I see your groin? Or I'm, and you said, can I see yours? <laughs> and you yeah, well, they, you they, they, yeah, yeah. well, well how, let me let me say that. Let me say that how that really happened. Yeah. She yeah. comes into my room. She was a she looked like an ex army nurse to me. She was she, the way she stood. So I mean, she was no, she I love this woman. So this, I have nothing bad to say about this woman. She's just doing her job the way everybody does their job when they do the same thing a thousand times a day. And uh, she comes into my room and, uh, and she was a nurse and she goes, I'm here to look at your groin because they've just done a catheterization. And um, I had, and I first said it to her, I said, well, my name is Stephen. What's yours? And so she told me her name, but she's still being very officious and very straight backed. And uh, so she goes, I'm here to, um, I'm here to look at your groin. And I said, I said, please, you know, uh, 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 maintain my dignity. And so I said, please maintain my dignity. And she goes, sir, I do this a thousand times a day. I've done this hundreds of times, whatever she said. And I said to her, can I see your groin? And she just pulled up. She just pulled up short and was like, and you could, you could hear the gears turning. And then all of a sudden she just softened and she just went, a whole thing, she just softened. And she said, she got it. She understood what I was doing. And, and she, and, and she said, would you mind if I, if I looked at your groin? And I said, no, go right ahead. And she, and she was very careful about maintaining my dignity. And, and when she left, she had a smile on her face and she felt better and I felt better. So when you do these things, you have to do them in a way that is not because you're bossy, but because you're being a better pa patient and you're being a better person for them. And I always say that if somebody comes into your room, not only do you introduce yourself and might find out what they're going to do, but you make sure that when they leave, they feel better about themselves than they did before they came in. You do that, you're going to get the best care in the hospital. Yes. Does that so, make, does that make yeah, sense? I know we're, we're – yes. I know we're, we're getting short on time. There's so many things I want to talk about, but I'm going to quickly just state what you kind of end the book with also saying that you wish – that every first year medical student had to spend a week in the hospital wearing a gown with no underwear and walking around in those little non-slip socks and that every second year would have to come in and take care of them. And, you know, I mean, it's great. I, I wish that they did have the time to take you up on that because why should they have the right to not understand what it's like. I started this whole thing by saying experience is everything. Mm -hmm. You can hear yep. about near-death experiences, but if you haven't had one, you can't tell someone else they didn't and that doctors should. But okay, so I've said that. I want you to tell something about bullying your heart and maybe okay, the well part about your foot. Because those, I mean, if you can explain it in about four or five minutes. <laughs> Those two things go hand in foot. So um, the uh, <laughs> all right. So when I was when I was released from the hospital the, the the second time, they told my parents that I wouldn't make it past ten, and I was six years old. Nobody told me that, but I knew it. I just knew it, and um, I could feel there were times when my heart wasn't right. I, I don't know if it was palpitations. I'll have ne I'll never know what it was, but I could feel it. And at those times, I would, I would, I would, I would yell at my heart mentally. I would yell at my heart to get back to work, to stop being so lazy. Sometimes I would do the thing that was making it feel bad, and I'd do more of it just to force it. So I was bullying my heart. That was bullying my heart. And um, the thing about the foot was, one day I was just sitting there, uh, cross-legged, 
in front of my window and I looked down at my foot and it occurred to me that one day this foot is going to be dead. I think I was about 11 when this happened. I said to myself, yeah, see, I've already beaten my expiration date. And uh, I said to myself, one day this foot is going to be dead and it's going to have a sock on it and there's going to be a shoe on it and it's going to be in a casket and it's going to be completely black in that casket, but it will be dead and I'll be dead. And I just kept saying it over to myself over and over again. One day this foot will be dead. One day this foot will die. One day, one day. And until I got myself into a trance. And this was my way of telling death I wasn't afraid of him. This was my way of embracing my death, uh, which is something I recommend everybody do. I hate to tell it to you, you're all going to die. How about that? All of us, we're all going to die. So you might as well accept the fact and do it with grace and dignity and live your, you know, as, as long as you're afraid of death, you're not living life. If you want to really live your life, embrace your death. That's what I think. So there you go. How's that? That's beautiful. And oh my God, this hour just flew by as well. I, there's so much wisdom because there's so much experience in your life. And I'm so glad you wrote a book. I really recommend that people uh, find it and you can't stop it. It's a real page turner. It's kind of weird to, you know, say that about somebody who's experienced the, the kinds of pain that you have. But you're a great writer. You do it with humor. It's really the way that you organized it was perfect. Everything foreshadows and goes right into the next event. And um, I'm I'm so glad I don't read that much, but I'm so glad I read your book. I'm so glad that I asked you to come on and you were willing to. And um, maybe we'll have another because there's there's so much but i know that probably people can look you up and find all sorts of interviews you've been on um so they can keep learning from your wisdom and i will keep you in my heart and learn all the different points that you talk about with prayer with gratitude with being grateful for even the things that you don't think you can be grateful for Oh my God, I'm just thinking of the time when you, you went home with the other heart and your dog went to jump on you and felt the difference in your heart and, and leapt off. It's just yeah. so many amazing stories. Um, but I'm, I'm going to have to say goodbye and just end the show like I always do. That please remember to hug your inner child because that little person you once were is still there with you today. And it's your job to bring him or her back to life. Because if you don't, no one will. So remember to hug your inner child before you go to bed tonight. This is Debbie Unterman thanking Steve Taibbi for being with me for the last two weeks. And thank you all. I am grateful for everyone who has tuned in to Love the Voices on Bold Brave TV. I will see you again next week. I hear you breathing, Steve. <laughs> Last Goodbye, <joke>. Debbie. <laughs> Goodbye. This has been Love the Voices with host Debbie Unterman. Tune in each week as Debbie will keep you engaged, enlightened, and entertained as she delves into cutting edge topics and challenges widely held beliefs. Thursdays, 6 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.